everyone. Uh, I'm joined by two fantastic guests today, who you've probably, hopefully, already heard from this spoiler season. Uh, so Thrasnos and Oddball, the, the co-hosts of Retromancer, uh, are joining me tonight. Uh, and we're going to have, you know, talk about the spoilers today and then just sort of talk about how it's going so far, because I think it's been uh, a really fun and interesting spoiler season and kind of worth stepping back every now and again and thinking about it. Um, but would the two of you like to introduce yourselves as well? All right. This is Steve Oddball. Yeah, it's just a pr privilege to be out here with you to chat about some spoilers this week. Boom. And I'm Thrasnos Nate, also from Retromancer, and uh, thanks for having us, Sigrin. Yeah. Um, and Simply the Onion, uh, this is going to be startup propaganda. I, Even though I, it's not my favorite format, I think it's such a fantastic thing for the game. It definitely deserves a lot of conversation and, um, and, and you know, really serious, uh, you know. Oh, no. Simply <laughs> doesn't like this. Well, you know what? It's, uh, it'll be, I think it's going to be a very, I think it'll be a fun time and interesting conversation for hopefully everyone. But oh, we no. the, 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 we walked into the room and immediately threw <laughs> <laughs> vegetables at us. Oh no! no oh no! no. Oh no! These no. guys. Well, we can always just we can always just ban simply the onion. It's all good. Um, so, but um, we also have we do have a spoiler to talk about, and then I will also tell everyone as a reminder that uh, Sokka is going to be streaming. I will say immediately after this because I suspect we'll have an hour to talk about. Uh, assuming both of you have an hour to just talk about startup and spoilers overall, um, and uh, and so Sokka will be doing a stream with I think a bunch of Jinteki spoilers, so we'll we'll get the the whole view on that whole faction. Um, but oh, yeah, let's. Oh, I'm excited. Yeah, it's it'll be spicy. What we'll finally find out what. P.E. Central is going to meet, you know, P.E. is central to the archetype of Borealis means. Um, but before we get oh. there, <laughs> we do have one card to talk about today, which is Ghost Tongue. And I, of course, oh my god, just that like, card is amazing. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, oh my god. Like, a really good character work on this art. Um, it is a two-to-install unique hardware. Is a cybernetic subtype, free influence in Anarch, and it says, when you install this hot hardware, suffer one core damage. The play cost of each event is lowered by one. Then the wow. flavor text is, among the ar arming the resistance with disarming charm. Wow. That is a horrifying image. <laughs> um, you know, wow. What do you think, Jeff? You know, I so this heart this card like immediately my brain goes, okay, there's a this is a an econ effect. We've seen a lot of different types of econ effects, so I can immediately start comparing it to those econ um things. Yeah. And the obvious one in startup and in standard, to be quite honest, is Mystic Mamie, right? That's in faction, comes down for a credit cheaper, doesn't cost us to take a core damage, uh, but is sort of softly capped at one credit per turn whereas this you know maybe there's maybe that that theoretical super fun deck where you're playing an event you know two to three times a turn this can be all of those extra credits um i think a lot of essa decks will look at this right away um but uh i it's interesting to think about uh what else this will uh if this, where else is this going to show up? I don't know. What are yeah, your two the thoughts? Fact that it, oh, I was going to just say, sorry to interrupt you, that uh, the fact that there's no limit to how many events you can play in a turn, and, and you do, you know you keep getting the discount, feels like maybe some other people think about importing it. Hmm. Yeah, I could. I mean, like, you've got... Uh, like, Krim decks, for example, are often, like, in the 20s, ish event space so 
maybe if you're a crim, like you could say, oh yeah, there's gonna be turns where I'm gonna play like bravado into the maker's eye into, you know, these sorts of high impact events. Um, yeah. But. I'm just thinking also like deep dive decks. If you've got to play multiple events to cheat your way in and plus deep dive gets discounted. Why not? Yeah. And if you're doing those, those super ambitious double deep dive turns on, and you're probably doing it with like a swift click somewhere in there, like, Oh yeah, I'll dirty laundry and play two deep dives and have saved three credits on this turn. Um, which I think is um, kind of cool. That feels impactful. And the other thing is, this almost feels like it could have been a console, and then you get to stack a console ability on top of this. Like, that's, like you said, with Swift, that seems great. Or Anacam, if you can. Yeah. No, go right ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, and as you were about to say, and I cut you off for no reason, uh, Anacam is... Uh, is also like a really fun possibility with this where you just get to chart like then you really are going to hit you know as much value as you possibly can because you'll get a free card draw in and probably get that second event trigger as well um, that feels good yeah um so i was thinking about uh like a, a good analog like you said is mystic mamie which is uh or or even prepaid Right, which is just like, like limited to like once per turn. A Mystic Mamie is increasing one per turn. Uh, and this this doesn't have that upper bound, but it still has an upper bound. And that's just simply, you. it's how many events that you can have, right? So um, in order to, like the way you're going to get the most value out of an effect like this is you're also going to have to have a lot of card draw. Um, and it's really going to be based on whatever your card draw is. So, um, like you said, Oddball, I think uh, deep dive decks are going to probably benefit from this the most because they're already utilizing a lot of events um, and they want to basically draw through their deck very, very quickly and win very, very early. Um I think what is kind of interesting, though, is say you're playing that type of deck and you don't draw this and your econ package is built around it, then what are you going to do? Are you just going to, you know, miss out miss out on that value for half your deck? I mean, I feel like that's the decks where you, uh, you're you playing prepaid, but you don't have access to um, Levier Lab Access and you get prepaid near the end and then you just like your whole econ uh, is is like broken effectively and you don't have enough money anymore. I do think that if you probably import this into like Criminal or Shaper, you're probably running it with prepaid voice pad. Like, would this be your like second or third prepaid instead of running three of them if you're heavy on events? I think no. Hmm. Yeah, I, it really depends on the cost of them. But like, for example, if you're going to run a card like this, are you going to run like Diesel, which is a zero cost event, which doesn't benefit from this? I mean, it's a card that you want. If there was a card that costs like one credit and drew you four, that would obviously be better. But well, yeah, um, there, is, there is, though. That's the, that's the thing I was actually going to go into is I think okay. you might spl splash VRcation into Anarch a little bit more now because it's oh, more sure. or less strictly upside compared to Diesel at the same influence value. Um, and oh, okay. Often in Anarch, like you don't need the like overdrawing is less of a big deal because you tend to pack slightly more redundancy in your toolkits. Um, if you're playing standard, there's obviously cards you actually actively want in the bin as well. Um, but it, it, I think this card is sort of interesting in, in that idea that you're right. The problem with this is for this to be better than Mystic Mamie, you really need to have a solid draw engine to support this and it's no one faction i think has enough card draw to reliably keep this proccing twice a turn so you have to start thinking about is it worth support right. putting all the support in or should i treat this more as like a one of in my essa deck that if i find it early my econ goes much smoother for the whole game but i have to kind of plan my deck to not have it every game right 
or um yeah i mean i guess i guess the difference between like mystic mamie and and like prepaid is is that the credits build up and so it not only says the turns where you don't have an event you're fine because you get to keep that credit but then also the turns where you have lots of events you can kind of burst them out um and uh, this actually plays in in either of those more akin to like mystic maybe than prepaid yeah i i definitely agree i think the mystic maybe i suspect will see a little bit more play than this mostly because this has like actual downsides on install doesn't work as well with keiko but i think it has it does have some real potential especially in these sort of essa core damage focused builds well and it's not it's not an event so if you if you get tagged you still get to retain the benefit yeah that's a very good point especially as we're seeing more and more tagging and more tag punish like in startup you know we're, we now saw yesterday a, a payoff card for getting a single tag in a way that startup hasn't had before and so now maybe you you do need to care a little bit more about what resources you can, you know, that, that tag ability of resources and has not been a huge problem in startup generally, but maybe it's become a little bit more uh, part of the format. Are they bringing back like self-tagging anarchs? Uh, I mean, is that where we think, is that where they think they're going with this? This, this could support that, right? You know, that's actually like these cybernetics could could be an alternative to these resource engines that we've seen. And it might be a reasonable case of like, oops, we made companions too good. So let's make a, uh, a mechanic that the companion decks can't use, utilize as well as other stuff. That definitely could be a direction hmm. to go. Yeah. Well, I mean, it also, it's always been part of their color pie. And I think like the designers have just had the most terrible time balancing it where it's like either absolutely terrible or it's like the most ridiculous oppressive thing ever and they're just like they can't they can't figure out like how to get self-tagging anarchs into like a reasonable deck and then um so i think i think personally it's a it's a dangerous mechanic like it's a no-no you shouldn't shouldn't go that direction but people really seem to love it so maybe they will Yeah, I think I it's that's that would be a, a quite called shot off of this single card. Um but uh you know, it's not, you know, if it's if you're right, you're you're going to look real smart in a year. So <laughs> I mean, I'm not even saying that's where they're going. It's just um it is it is a possibility and uh and that would be very interesting. Yeah. You know, another thing I was with uh, some of the people in the chat were talking uh, about um, maybe this is just Asa Tech where, you know, you don't necessarily want to install Marrow or carry multiple copies of Marrow, but you've got Ghost Tug as like just a backup way to do core damage yourself. So there's at least it's got another use to in a current archetype. Yeah, you know, it's I I got to, and maybe I'll I'll like, it's not secret tech or anything. I went and built a um, a standard asset list today, um, and like one of the things I was I doing it. was just playing uh, running hots for like pure value, and I had Mystic Mamies in there to help the econ feel smoother. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Well, when I'm looking at this list, I'm like, oh, okay. Well, that costs three. This costs three. This costs two. Like. Basically, I can play a bunch of cards that are all, you know, mid credit cost, and you know I could just take the same list, say, oh, you know what, Mystic Mamie is a little bit, you know, if I trade this out for an extra trigger of my ID ability, maybe that's like that's pretty solid in this list just right off the bat. Um, so, yeah, I like that swap. You know, or you could have both. Why not have both? I actually kind of, I actually kind of think that having both in faction is pretty meaningful, because uh, it gives you. I mean, the thing about Mystic Mamie, she doesn't stack, right? So, um, finding something that she does stack with is a big deal. 
I actually had another idea, um, which was, uh, and I don't really know how, I don't know how good this is, but it fits with the Anarch color pie of, um, the Anarchs are sort of drawing lots of cards and using the ones that are most useful at this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, so that would include, and then, and then basically have a bunch of card value, um, card effects. So things like, um, you know, Faust, I mean, Faust isn't in the game, but, uh, uh, moshing, for example, would be like, just get rid of your extra cards. Um, so maybe the idea is you fill your deck with events that are pretty expensive, and then you just sacrifice them until you draw this, and then once you play it, now you unlock, you know, access to them again, basically. Or uh, Steel Skin. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Stealing Oddball Sunder there. Yeah, it's all good. I mean, it's basically Diesel then with this just, card. You should have just said it, man. <laughs> I should have just should have smoked it up. <laughs> and it works when you do core damage yourself if you happen to pig that specific card out. So fantastic. Why not just have a uh, Anarch Diesel? That's better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Steel skin. Anarch yeah, Diesel with upside. Skin. Yeah, Steel Skin. What steel is Skin is. I mean, like, I've had versus great. Steel skin is looking quite solid, the same, you know, like a very good replacement. So, steel skin. Oh, they did that on purpose. Now we're going to call it steel skin all the time, and there's going to be <laughs> vengeance. Oh. Yeah, that was a good callback. Oh, man. Yeah. That's, some, that's some classic Netrunner right there. I know, yeah. It's, I I think when that was spoiled, I went over the the lore behind that because that is some some deep lore for people that have joined more recently. Um, but let me just quickly scroll through the chat, uh, see if there's anything. Yeah, I I like the epic win is saying you know that this is because ghost tongue is sort of the build around and high influence. It's a little bit tricky to import. It being unique also makes it kind of tricky to like. How many copies do you really want to run because you want to see it early mm -hmm. enough but you don't want to see a bunch of them kind of thing though may maybe an anarch with moshing you don't care about that as much especially because moshing does work with steel skin you know you're more okay with having some of those unnecessary duplicates just to get your your engine spinning up a bit sooner yeah i think it fits very well in anarch anarch has the most expensive well i don't know if they do now but they used to they're like yeah three cost events retrieval run you know yeah or what's that new, what's the new one the new uh the new oh, trash uh, your hand card corp whatever it's called uh chishtushka uh or... yeah the, the, yeah the overpowered card that one <laughs> just chastushka yeah, yeah so that one costs three so they're all about three cost events so you're always going to have value in something like this it's odd that it is going to be a little different for anarchs than it is going to be for other factions like other factions feel like they're going to get a better like sort of like be able to use it more effectively but then anarchs are like using it differently but it's still going to be very effective for them retrieval yeah. run i actually yeah retrieval run is a is a nice shout it was a, a card i had not i don't think about much because in standard like you know you don't really need it but in startup i i definitely see it having a nice little place for getting getting your breakers out you know letting you say oh i'm I don't need them right now. I can moshing them away and know that I have a way to grab them back later in the game. Uh, it's you know quite relevant. So yeah, I thought I thought like um, oh, it's really weird how like retrieve installing things from archives was always like a part of Anarch and even in I think it was like it might have been the core set or it was like definitely the very first cycle that Retrieval Run was printed and it was like there and I think. I think there were a couple of decks early on that were using it to install like Morningstar. Uh, yeah. And that's, or, uh, and that was like a whole thing. But then uh, once clone ship came out, it was just like, it was gone forever and no one ever played it again. Cause clone ship parasite mid run was like objectively better. Um, but when you play with a smaller card pool, being able to get things like your parasites back out again, so you can get multiple instances of them. Um, like when we did drafts and stuff like that, it turned out to be really powerful. And um I just think it's interesting because Retrieval Run is a powerful effect, but there 
been so many other cards that have just like massively overshadowed that whole mechanic of Anarchs pulling stuff out of their archives that it's it's just like forgotten to the wayside. <laughs> Yeah, no, I it's I was I just went ahead to go and look and uh retrieval run it uh was in future proof, so the last card in Genesis. And actually uh uh creation control is the next product out. So like it had like okay. that very brief window in the sun and then everyone was like, Nope, go on to clone ship for me. It's a very not future proof card, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, though I will say, like, this is this is a real power pack. It's got DLR, Fairy, indexing, R and D interface in the same pack. Wow! And this this was also Eli Beal. Wow, this oh is quite gosh. the pack. Oh my gosh! R and D interface. Ronin. Project oh, Beal. Yeah, oh Ronin. my god! And mid seasons. Oh, this is like this is the pack to have. Jeez. Yeah, yeah pack I'll six is for whatever work. reason. Or, or FFG's wow. favorite packs. They saved all the good cards for the final one. They were like, all right, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to print all the bad cards. Faust is a bad card. We're going to put that in the first pack, and then we'll put the counters to them in the sixth pack. And then, you know, and then people are like, this card's oppressing us. And they're like, oh, the counter's coming. And then they're like, production <laughs> delays. And we're like, oh, we've been stuck with Museum for six months. What's happening? No, it was, <laughs> it was Museum, wasn't it? It was early it was, in the cycle. Yeah. And then the counter to it, like was supposed to come but it just got delayed and we had to suffer through it yeah i can't spell awesome. this yeah, but yeah <laughs> oh right right Salset slums was supposed to be the answer but this yeah this is pack one and then Salset. i thought archives Slum interface was the answer oh i was assuming it would be Salset slums so that you could at least permanently remove stuff but is that what it all right so let me see i gotta remember i don't remember what this was <laughs> archives That's interface was map. order and chaos which actually was already out i believe at the time of mumbad oh gosh i love i love archives interface i love hard like <laughs> that one of the anarch things is like hardware that's insanely good uh oh yeah ew sale set slums geez yeah why would you do that when you could just run archives and trash it for free yeah <laughs> Uh, I don't know why that card wasn't very good. I was I was super into that. It was it was a fun fantasy of a card, but it is sort of a little bit doesn't. It only does something if the corp has a plan to get it back, get their cards back, which you know not every corp ever did. Uh, and they also it cost three credits for some reason, right? Like I think that was the thing that really that really burned <laughs> yeah. it. If it had cost like one, you would have seen it in a lot more. Yeah, I th I think I think so. They didn't um, want to. They didn't want to kill Brian Stinson before he was printed, though. So, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Got gotta save that future design space, right? So, <laughs> actually, um, I was thinking when I saw Ghost Tongue, I was thinking about um, like something uh, like how how do you uh, how do you get more value out of this? Well, being able to play the cards from your archives more, right? So levy is one way, but um. Like, it just occurred to me that, like, maybe someone would have the great idea to make it so that you could play a card from archives. And I was like, oh, yeah, if that existed, then, then Ghost Tongue would, be, Ghost Tongue would <laughs> be insane. And then I was like, oh, yeah, and then we could make it cost nothing. That's a great idea, everybody. Let's make it so you can play cards from archives for free. <laughs> and then that it, I was like, oh, yeah, what? I don't know why anybody thought that was ever a good idea. That was, like, the worst decision ever. Hey, we'll make it really expensive and hard to do. We'll make them forfeit agendas, and they definitely won't be stealing agendas and just getting us stuck in a horrible prison. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, my favorite, my favorite ever, Damon Stone line. Jesus, <laughs> was he said? Somebody asked him, Damon, why did you, why did you ban? Uh, um, it wasn't museum. It was the the one that gives you two recurring credits. What was that card? Um, uh, uh, it's the it's the temple Mumba Temple, yeah. Oh. And they were like, Damon, why did you why did you ban Mumba Temple? And he's like, because money should matter. And I was like, wow, like that. That's it. There you go. That's actually the answer to every problem. Really, is like you know they didn't really quite figure it out right then, but he was on to something there. Yeah, just being able to, to get access to all the money was a big deal. Um, what what a quotable line. Yeah. <laughs> it's to matter. June, why did uh, you ban Rizeki? 
<laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm coming around to that idea. So, um, but I actually, I thought, you know, you guys very nicely when I was like, hey, we're going to have to fill some air tonight, came up with some fantastic questions. So I figured, why don't we get started going through some of those? Um, and then maybe I'll ask your own question back to you guys first, which is, you know, what are your thoughts on new win conditions for each of the factions? Um, and... Oh, well, uh, you, wow. you go ahead. You go ahead, Steve. So I'm, I really like the very impactful corp cards. Like, and I'm, it seems like each faction might be getting one. I don't know if that's going to happen, but uh, like big deal and mutually assured destruction just feels very evil mecha corp -y. Uh it, this is just a bird's eye view, overview of everything. So I just like that we're getting really impactful events that are doing really cool things. Whether or not that's the end all be all or all the tools are there for them yet just feels really, really neat. So um, the cards we're specifically talking about here, we have uh, Big Deal. Is Mutually Assured Destruction like the, the one for Wayland? Is that the idea? It might be, yeah. I mean, it's 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 but a I just big. Really win the game. Yeah, it's it's an interesting one because like we're we're putting it in the category of a win condition, but I think it's probably more of a win condition in standard where like two yeah. tags does actually just win the game outright. Um, sometimes. Um, mm. Whereas like it's a little bit harder right now in startup to go. Okay, so I gave the runner an arbitrary number of tags, what do I actually do to finish that out? Well, and I think uh, they I think they probably have some more cards coming out, but uh all right, so like like assuming that that um a bunch of tags somehow can be leveraged into a win condition, mutually assured destruction is kind of like this this new Wayland win condition. Um what and I don't see I don't see the the NBN one. Which one? What was the name again? Um, uh, are you thinking of backroom machinations? Maybe. Uh, yes. Yeah. Sacrifice a tag, gain a victory point. Yeah. Let me let me do some um, shuffling and resizing so I can fit all three of those on screen. And we're still waiting on the Jinteki one, right? Hopefully, it'll be spoiled really soon. Oh boy! I'm I'm excited. I'm excited. I gotta say. All of these cards, all three of these cards that we've seen so far are like very fun. Super fun, super interesting, super powerful. Um, oh, great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. So I feel like Backroom Machinations is probably going to be the strongest one. Um, actually, it's probably not going to be that strong in standard. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't really know. I've been out of it for a while. But um, in startup, it's going to be a huge deal. Uh, it's not a big deal. It's going to be a huge deal yeah. <laughs> because, uh, because um, like there are a lot of decks that can benefit really well from just running all three pointers. Like basically any like kill deck is like, you know, I don't, I don't want to play the game. I just want to kill you with like clearing house or something like that. Um, that's a, that's, that's great. It's a great deck that exists and uh, it wants to run all three pointers um, lower. It's like uh, I can't, it can't lower its agenda density, but as few agendas as possible, control where they go. Um, but it doesn't, it's really hard to score out on a deck like that. Um, so being able to just throw in a extra single victory point floating around in your deck is really, really powerful for those types of decks, and it's going to enable them really well. And NBN is kind of, at least in startup, becoming like more of a glacier faction. They're really good at um, taxing, but not necessarily ending the run. And uh, we've seen all the cards in the next set are really supporting that as well. So um, I expect to see stuff like big NBN Glacier decks with reversed accounts, clearing house, you know, send a message, uh, Bologna, punitive counter-strike, and then like backroom machinations to try to like finish out the game um, by just putting a, a couple like tagging cards in there, like a uh, fun house or whatever. So I think that one's going to be super duper competitive. Um, did you guys want to add anything to that before I moved on to the other ones? Well, the one thing I was thinking of with uh, 
mutually assured destruction, at least in startup, you might have because there's it's a lot harder to get rid of a lot of tags at once. You probably have the psycho Beal win for NBN or just psycho graphics in general with like orbital. So you have some options to maybe do a surprise kill with orbital or score out a Beal that hopefully is big enough to get the rest of your points would be how I'm seeing mutually assured destruction is working at startup. That's really interesting. Yeah. I hadn't thought about using, um, what's it called? Shoot, you literally just said it and it f left my mind. Mutually assured destruction? No, uh, the 4-2 uh, that does damage. Orbital superiority. Or orbital, orbital superiority. superiority. As a card oh, that yeah. literally I had like, I was like, I never will think about this card again. And that's totally <laughs> fine. But yeah, maybe, maybe you could do, I'm like, it's getting my jank tanks brewing. Um, oh man. Oh, I'm that's like, our jam. Okay. Yep. So if I'm, if I'm in Wayland, I can play orbital superiorities. I can play mutually assured destruction and psychographics is how much influence. I think it's um, three, but I could be wrong. Yeah, it is three. Okay. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge, but maybe I can come up with a deck where I can score, a, you know, use orbital superiority, like give them a bunch of tags, psychographics to score an orbital superiority. And then I guess if I have to, either neurospike or do something else. Uh, <laughs> To make sure I get that that uh, six damage I need to lock in the win, um, we've we've seen a couple really weird sort of combos with orbital superiority. It's actually like a very fun jank card because there are so many interesting ways to do stuff with it. Um, you can, uh, for example, just like have one on the table, um, score one to give them a tag, and then try to like um, score one like out of hand or something like that. <laughs> uh oddball and i actually had this like really it was terrible amazing deck idea where you have a six advanced vladisi bearsk <laughs> and then you have the orbital superiority in your server and then um you install advance advance and then on the runner's turn move to advancements onto it uh and then what it was uh and then yeah no you only need four yeah so you you install advance advance on the runner's turn move to advancements start of your turn score it give them a tag click one install another one advance advance move two counters on score the second one um so All you right. use you use it as your your uh what, what was the card um Ooh, that's a great host, hosted bounty basically okay uh that was that was good I, that's one of my favorites yeah, I guess we're, we're the idea. More of that in the end. Yeah, the, I guess that. So I do think something like maybe if you're gonna do the psychographics thing, I think like NEH probably has the draw to support that, especially with DBS. So like you can ha you'll be spamming out cards. The runner either has to go and trash all your assets, or as is usually the correct play, they check it, say, "I don't care if you get a pad campaign for the rest of the game," and now suddenly they maybe kind of have to think about it at some point. Because they'll you'll turn it around and say, "Oh, I'll blow up all these econ assets that I don't need," and I'm threatening to win. You know, if you're sit sitting on seven tags and I have two psychos in hand, two psychographics in hand, I can just go psycho psycho on the beal and and get third. You know, get seven points in in a single card. Yeah, definitely. Oh, that's exciting. Oh no, why are we taking all of Wayland's cards and putting them in a beal? Oh no, I'm, this, I've this been is... here before. Yeah, I mean, I think until we get a real kill threat, and I think, you know, unfortunately for Wayland in startup, I think we've seen all of their cards in Midnight Sun. So, hmm. um, interesting. Oh, um, let's hold on. I need to adjust this so that influence values. Can be, okay, it's only I should say it's only for influence on mutually assured destruction. So. <laughs> There we go. That'll that'll keep NBN from using it. I, yeah. I'm I'm sure this has worked for us in the past. Yeah, yeah. four influence cards. It's it's a really good thing. There's no 17 influence NBN IDs. Um. <laughs> Wait, there's two of them. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! It's so funny. It's like we just keep repeating the sins of the past without like being aware of it at all. It's great. I mean, maybe that's we're just doomed. We're just doomed to live in this cycle. It's fine. We should enjoy it.
before we move uh, on, uh, Toke's AX in the chat said, public trail, into or- install orbital, into big deal for the win. Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of money. <laughs> 21 credits. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. I do think like I'm fairly high on big deal because if you can rush two agendas out, which is like a thing that corpse can do in startup, um, then you can like be like, all right, I get to have a whole backup game plan now, where you know I can just click for credits. You know, probably you can do better than that. Something like defense campaign, or sorry, definitely didn't just say a play test name, refuge campaign. Um, maybe helps you get there and you're playing like architects of tomorrow or uh oh, you know, precision design yeah. um and you just go a little bit more glaciery and then just say all right you gotta find my agendas before before i can get to 17 credits to just win the game or 18 credits and win the game i might i actually think this is sort of a weird jake but i'm hoping Jiteki gets a 5-3 or a larger agenda for startup because then big deal gets really interesting for Jiteki if you could make a Jiteki deck that makes money. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that could be huh. a fun import. So then we're bringing back like Glacier Jiteki. I mean, they said that this was going to be the PE set, right? Um, but I'm definitely not opposed to them. I, I don't like factions being like Glacier factions versus Rush, rush factions. I really like this the entire spectrum existing for for every faction because um because they all have different tempo plays which are really really fun um so i'd be excited to see like a glacier jinteki yeah and, and you guys someone did me, point I... out go ahead no no you you take it uh somebody in chat i think it's in page mentioned that uh clot stops a lot of these weight conditions which is very true but uh, I, I just responded that we did get a new version of uh, the Cyberdex virus suite that's going to be legal in startup. Yeah. Um, and to answer uh, DND DMDB's question, uh, there is not, we have not seen all the NBN cards. I am actually, well, a, a champ is dropping one tomorrow um, and it's they're doing it. I was able to convince them to do it in a video collaboration with me. So we'll have the full set of NBN cards, I think as of tomorrow uh but up until then we have not um let me go see if i can find the new cvs um okay 47 my virus yes or is it or is it i, I mean <laughs> it's i think it's probably maverus but the name what looks the? like my virus and my I'm, virus. I'm super excited about that <laughs> Uh, isn't there a, isn't there an emoji here on Twitch for this? <laughs> uh, I got I got to try and see if I can get some some custom emojis in the chat and maybe my virus will be one of them. Uh, isn't there like I'll find, a, isn't there like I'll find a way to like memeify my virus? Fedora guys in here, right? Exactly, my virus. Um so yeah, like I'm, I'm excited to see. You know, I, I asked you guys this question, but you originally pitched it to me. Um, <laughs> of you know, what are your thoughts on having strong new win conditions in each faction? And I, I am super excited for it. Um, it's been like, I think, I, I might even. Uh, the challenge for me in startup has often been. It feels like a lot of my corp decks like are just, do I draw in exactly the order I need to beat a a runner who knows what they're doing? And as you add more win conditions and um, diversify them across different corporations, runners have to account for more different ways to not lose, which then means that each individual one gets a little bit better. Um, And and so I'm really hoping that this Mm -hmm. makes startup a format that offers me a little bit more agency as the corp than I feel like I've had when I've been dipping into it uh, lately. That's a, oof, that's a really good point. So I actually, um, so having played and, and, and basically experienced the exact same thing you're describing in startup, right? Which is a, a limited format. So it's easier to kind of like, kind of grok our way into these, these like, like this is kind of the whole situation. 
Um, so we're like looking at it. We're like, corpse kind of are just like, it feels like when you win as the corp, like it's because the runner didn't win. <laughs> it's like the cor- the runners are really driving the, the wins in startup right now. And I mean, because corps are a little underpowered. Um, I kind of wonder, like, I personally feel like that's, that as a principle is actually ideal. Um, that's going to sound a little terrible, but, um, but like the way that Netrunner is designed is that like the runner is, is the, the, the person with the agency um, and they're really driving uh, the course of the game. And obviously we want corpse to be able to drive the game as well. That's extremely important to the game design, but all of the times where corpse have been strong enough to like take the lead and drive the pace of the game. Like, I feel like all of them have been really bad. Hmm. And there've been a couple that have just like, just dialed it in like just perfectly. Um, which is awesome. But, uh, yeah, a lot of the times where it's like, yeah, Corpse taking the lead, they got all the tempo and it's like, cool. All right. Well, if I'm, if I'm not, you know, sitting on 18 credits by turn three, so I can trash your, uh, what is it? Commercial bankers union, you know, then like, I'm going to get absolutely. Oh, well, there's the old 25 credit swing. And now I'm dead to EOI. That's awesome. That's interesting. Cause, cause I think like standard, like it's funny. All of the good players have been like saying, "Oh, it's a runner meta at top tables," and they've been saying it for three years. And Corp has never dipped below a fifty-five percent win rate at top tables, um, or something like that. Like it's you know, every, the last two worlds have been runner metas where Corps have won more often. Um, Whoa. <laughs> so the, the corpse the corpse were smart that's the key you know you got to let them think that they're going to win yeah. that's how you that's that's how they that's how they lose um oh okay i do want to quickly share that sanjay saying it's a real tragedy this card wasn't around for phil to put a little hat on each of them of viruses um because i i <laughs> phil uh i will commission this alt art for you and uh just just keep get in touch um and i like i so, but to go back to the actual topic of what we we're talking about, I really like the game when runners are a little bit unfavored, because I think the thing that happens more often huh. is you end up on more hail mary runs. Uh, when runners yes. are ahead, yeah. it's very often like, as a at a certain point in, as the corp, you just go, well, I will kind of hope that they mess up. Or I will put my agenda in, knowing a hundred percent that they can get in, and just hope that I out bluff them, which like sometimes has interesting moments to it, but often ends up feeling like the runner can just do the math and go, okay, well, like I can't actually lose if I check this. Um, whereas wow. if the runner's ahead and then they're forced to go, is this like, oh, maybe I can't bust the remote this turn, or if I bust the remote this turn. I'm go like I have to choose between dying to boom or trying to steal the agenda that they put in the remote in the same turn. And so I have to make a decisive choice and then I get to make this big flashy play and win or lose like it's a it's gonna it'll be, awesome. be an ex- it's a, it's a, this exciting climax whereas yeah. I feel like runner leading metas often are just this like super just, stale and boring boring for both players. Yeah, like, I, I will say, like, you, they can have, they will still, like, Netrunner has such good bones for a game that there will be really good moments in runner-favored metas, but I think the, like, end of the game, which is often what you remember as you finish, it, like, you'll play this long, like, 30-minute game that's got lots of back and forth, but whoever, what the last turn looks like has such an influence on how you reflect on and think about the game. At least it does That's, for me. That is so true. Oh my, you are so right. That's a really good point. It's, uh, do you remember back in the day, I think we we had established the three phases of a Netrunner game where the early game belongs to the runner, the mid game belongs to the corp, and the late game belongs to the runner. Um, yes. 
Yeah. And but that like that hasn't always been true. Um but I almost feel like like you're exactly right. Um if the <laughs> it's actually it's actually kind of right on both sides, right? Is this that, Yeah, uh, it really is, it, right? If one player is like way overpowered, they're like, "I know I can just sit here and uh, just do nothing and and win the game." And that's actually probably more based on like how good specifically the glacier decks are because glacier decks are good and important uh or i guess you could have combo decks that are also have super powerful late game win conditions like a lot of um like it's a lot of ctm decks right like you're going to get tagged eventually and then when you do then i'll be able to play my operations and win the game um but uh and i it, like from playing other games since i since i kind of stopped playing netrunner for a while and i tried other games i kind of learned that like uh the the like basically like one deck is always going to be better in the late game than the other deck. Um, and so the players kind of need to like learn from each other's decks and go, okay, your deck is better late game than mine is. So it's on me to try to win sooner rather than later. Um, and uh, so actually uh, Steve and I were just playing a deck, like a corp deck like that, where we're like, okay, this is the rush Jinteki deck i have to win before my opponent um before my opponent can uh but then it's like when you have this like infinitely powerful late game win condition that that we've got to be cautious but i don't even know if that's necessarily the end of the world because um because we've seen that just be fine too you know like you're like oh well yeah but oftentimes the other player can and does win before that inevitable win condition goes off or there's you know some way to get around it that's really interesting you're right i do not yeah. like it when the runner has the late game inevitability because then they just sit there and do nothing yeah and uh, i'm, and I'm trying to think that's boring like, for both players <laughs> yeah when when it's just like I, fundamentally a weird thing about the game of netrunner is if the i think actually like big one of the interesting things to me about big deal is that it changes us a little bit but the one of the inevitabilities was like as um like the runner has a way to convert an infinite amount of money into a win in that that allows them to access any card they want. But as the corp, you're like, after a certain amount of money, you've literally rezzed all your ice. And so you've got nothing else you can do. Like you don't have an, a, an active agency to turn your huh. money into an actual win there. Um, and oh. so that's, that's actually, I think part of the logic of like corpse are winning the mid game uh, huh. is because that's where the corpse money is relevant. And at the end game, it can be fairly irrelevant in certain cases. Um, I actually uh, brought up another point in our podcast a couple, maybe like a month or two ago, Yasengrin, um, where I said, and 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 I, I think about it more and more because it was something that had only occurred to me recently at the time. And, and I think about it and it's like, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. So, Money means something different for corpse and runners um, in Netrunner because um, if the runner gets a lot of credits, that just means that they have more agency over the corp. And they can use that sometimes to accelerate their win condition. Like, uh, I'm going to use my money to install Medium and I'm going to run R&D a bunch of times and I can afford to run R&D a bunch of times because I have a bunch of cards. Um, but if you don't have a card like that, you kind of got to wait for the corp to draw into their situation. The corp, on the other hand... Um, the more money they have, the faster they can end the game. And ideally, yeah. um, if you have a bunch of money as the corp, you're basically able to leverage that into scoring agendas um, sooner and therefore accelerate the pace of the game. So uh, money for corporations in Netrunner um, actually has this unique ability to basically literally just accelerate the game. Um and, and it, that's not true for runners in the same way. So it's interesting that, like you're saying here, um, this gives you something to do after all of your ice has been res, um, you know, and like you, you just, you're sitting on this pile of money. But I would actually uh, like posit that uh, you, corps are just going to be able to like use that money advantage to try to score their agendas sooner because they're going to have more security earlier on in the game anyway. Um, yeah. Which is also why uh, not having Siphon in Startup is kind of interesting, <laughs> but it seems to work out. 
Yeah, yeah. Actually, I was one of the things you were saying there uh, in that middle of like, oh, if the runner gets really ahead in the mid game, they still kind of have to wait for a gens to show up because like really the only good R and D multi access in the format at the moment uh, is Keyhole, or sorry, not Keyhole, Stargate, <laughs> the other one. Um, yeah. And that has, like, some really strict limitations, right? Like, if I'm up by 20 credits and I could run R&D, like, three times, like, in theory, I could play Conduit, but I'm not going to be in that situation enough for Conduit to be better than Stargate. And so I play Stargate, and now I have to sit and wait for the next turn while the Corp, you know, I trash whatever best card the Corp could draw and then kind of have to sit there. One of the reasons I'm actually really excited about Sabotage being added is it's a way for the runner, if they are ahead, to accelerate that access game plan oh that's a super good point because say they don't trash any agendas they just trash their handful of cards to sabotage now they have no cards so they got to draw up and since they're drawing up it's putting new cards on r&d which is great for the runner it's accelerating it's accelerating the game exactly like i was saying for corpse but for the runner that's actually super interesting and there's wow. actually now cheap you could even have uh, the new resource that got added for the Edarchs. Um, I would have to just look up her name very quickly. Yeah. Avagastina Ivonskaya. I probably said that wrong, but where what's a turn if you're installing viruses already? Like, imagine a Hoshiko deck that's just like, hey, I flipped my chisel out. Are you going to lose another card from your hand or are you lose it from your deck? Uh, I installed an imp now. Um, and then the little TD. Death by a thousand cuts is going on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I think it's interesting. You know, uh, the epic wind is saying like, "Oh yeah, this is this is you know that's relevant if you're ahead," and like, yeah, I you know sometimes cards are only good when you're when you're ahead, and that doesn't have to be. That's not actually a terrible thing to have in Netrunner. Um, you know, it's there was a, a great stim hack article. Uh, oh boy, I feel like that's got to be like a 2014 article or something like that, where like win more cards are actually really important to helping Netrunner feel so exciting um, oh. because like a, a different like in like there's this. When you come from like a Magic the Gathering or some other cards, like there's a lot of win more situations where it's like, um, oh, this card's only good if I'm already doing the game, so it's you know why not just include a card that actually helps me get to that win in the game? But in Netrunner, you often have like in Magic, it's like oh, okay, well I have one creature now, I have two creature now, I have three creatures, and they're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and so that's gonna I'm gonna build up. I'm like always building my my turn three is always stronger than my turn two kind of continuously this simplifying magic a lot and i i play it very casually but um <laughs> net runner has a lot more peaks and valleys and so you actually uh -huh. want to be able to exploit your peaks relative to your opponent's troughs as much as possible um, oh, yeah. and i think that's well because and that because the balance of power is naturally switching as opposed to just being like I have more stuff than you, therefore I'm just going to continue having more stuff. And exactly. there's nothing you can do about it. Netrunner is like, okay, that's cool, but the game is going to continue on and the balance of power is going to shift despite our board states. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, and, and, you know, to some extent, I think Corps have been lacking some of those win more cards in Startup. Um, and hopefully some of these like win condition cards that we're talking about, they often are kind of know, win more yeah. cards. Like I'm only playing Mutually Assured Destruction to then play a Psychographics if I have a board state where I'm way ahead of the runner, where I've like installed six assets out wide. Wait, um, I thought you would just I thought you would just use it to just like trash your entire board, wait for one turn, then win the game. I mean, or in like stand you know, trash yeah. most of your board. Yeah, in standard, that's you're what I'm, like you're gonna yeah. self apocalypse and then you know play your event from hand or whatever. Right, but I actually have to be ahead to make that happen, right? But the idea I, is, well, what do you mean ahead? I have to have some. Like hypothetically, I'm like, okay, 
if the runner has infinite, like is way ahead of me on credit totals, right? They can actually say, the only way I lose this game is if you play a mutually assured destruction, give me 12 tags, I can only clear down to eight, and you go psycho psycho next turn, right? Uh -huh. So my line is to go through and trash your pad campaigns, trash your uh, daily, well, not daily quest, what's the other, uh, it, not increased drop rates. The one that sees a lot of play in startup and uh, trash all your all your assets that give you money. Exactly, trash all those assets that give you money, and that way I can't actually lose to the mutually assured destruction play. So like, there's the there's huh. those games where the runner is going to get out to a blazing start and like keep you from like let's say we're any age in this example, keep you from ever really building out a board. But if you are any age and you've built out that board, it's often really hard to actually go and close that against, like, say, these virus, these virus Hoshiko lists we've been seeing that can just, like, chisel botulus, like, do all this stuff to blow up your ice. Um, yeah. And so what Mutually Sure Destruction, in theory, does, right, is you get to then just say, no, I am ahead at this point in time, I've got a bunch of assets down. I've got a bunch of res ice. Let's win next turn. Soon you're going to start trashing them, so I might as well just get some value out of them while I can. Yeah. I think, actually, I think you brought up a really good point that um, it's something I haven't thought about in a long time. Um, but it's, it's very true where you say, we've reached the point in the game where credits don't matter as much so like as a corp you're saying like i'm gonna install ice and i'm gonna use that to keep you out and that basically means you have to go get cards you have to spend money you have to spend card draw you have to spend resources to respond to my cards and now that you've responded to my cards now my cards aren't useful anymore like they've done they've done their job they've delayed you so i'm going to get further use out of them by trashing them giving a bunch of tags and, and leveraging that into a different win condition and I think that's very cool. That's uh, actually, I just want to, we never even got to the point where we were talking about the other cards. I mean, we just talked about them all the time, but um, thematically, Wayland destroying their own stuff is very fitting and awesome. And we haven't seen a lot of cards like around that aspect of the game, really. Um, and it fits very well into like a, uh, like a rig shooter gear check. Well, Rig Shooter uh, Wayland, for example, basically uses ice as a gear check, which then gets turned off as the runner gets their programs, and then you snipe their programs to turn it back on, right? The ice is taxing. It's just, it's, it's a binary state. It either it does a lot or it does absolutely nothing. Um, and so this is leaning into that very same color pie in a totally different way where you're saying, my car did something, now it does nothing, so I'm going to do one more thing with it. You know, I'm going to trash it to get a different ice or I'm going to trash it to, uh, you know, dig out some really cool card. What do you got? What do you got there, Steve? Infinite See, uh, Nutshell. Talking, bro. <laughs> I, I know. Infinite Nutshell in the comments had an amazing uh, thing they wrote. Uh, Wayland uses every part of the buffalo. Oh, yeah. There you go. That's, 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 that's exactly what we're talking about. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's actually really interesting, you said, Grin, that you were thinking about it from, like, the NEH perspective, where you're like, I have all these trashable assets, I'm going to I'm gonna destroy them before they, uh, before they kind of stop being useful. And I was actually only thinking about it in terms of, like, trashing ice. Like, I'm thinking, like, I've got this, I've got this board, it's got, like, 12 ice on it, I'm just going to trash all of my ice. And it was, it's not really about being ahead as much as it is just about, like, I... We've we've competed against each other to this mid game. Now I'm just gonna apocalypse my own board, um, which I, I'm not really losing anything because you were getting in anyway. So who cares? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean that's that's another really valid you know use case for all of this. I've been I think I look at stuff like Ob and mutually assured destruction. I go, oh, assets are the place I have a hundred percent control over what cards are rezzed. Because that is the one sneaky line of text on mutually assured destruction, is it's trash it any number, is that it has to be rezzed. Um, right. So you can't just like, you 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 actually have to sacrifice value. Well, I mean, you know, cards on the table is value, but um, yeah, like real value as opposed lot, to some yeah, a lot of investment. 
So, man, what if they had printed this card instead with with? Oh, this would have been good. Oh, it, it, <laughs> instead it says, as an additional cost to, to play this card, you must pay the cost of all the cards you're trashing, okay. and then we would have immediately just broken it with some silly combo. <laughs> Oh, well, I just play my combo and I avoid the costs and win the game. It's quite easy. Yeah. That would have gotten that would have gotten Steve going for sure. Uh, yeah. Um, all right. Sokka stream should be starting in a few minutes, any minute now, basically. Um, so I guess, you know, I, I we'll have to do a, a follow up because you guys had a bunch of great questions that I'd, I'd love to chat with you guys mo about more sometime. Um, but I guess, you know, let's, let's go around some final thoughts on how we feel, you know, at the end of this first week of, of scoop season. I'm just really excited. I think there's been all the, the new keywords that the rudders got, I think lived up to the hype that they were coming. Mark feels very criminal. Uh, the sabotage, very anarch charge you know kind of shapers building on themselves we have a boat i mean what more can you want there's a boat <laughs> and, and yeah so i feel like just a lot of the scoops get me really excited to play talk about the game i'm really looking forward to getting to actually play these cards in the coming week what about you nathan um i'm really excited to see that their design direction has leaned more towards um increased power levels uh well i yeah i think i think it's probably fair to say that they've upped the power level a little bit um i know that their design was intentionally with um the ashes cycle to uh keep things kind of very very simple very easy to introduce people to uh and that was that was awesome um it also kind of produces somewhat more like homogenous play. Uh, and um, so I'm excited to see them pushing it a little bit further. Uh, it's it's always going to be exciting. And I think now is a great time to do it too. So I'm pumped. Yeah, I've, I've been super excited. I've been like waiting to see these cards come out for, for such a long time. Um, and uh, it's it's so great. I'm so glad to see people be so positive about these. Like I was legitimately a little bit worried that like a lot of the people that played mostly startup would be like, I don't know if we should let corpse do this kind of stuff. But I think you know, um, it's really nice to see. Like, and I think that's like this is one of my like. I need to get over my anti-startup bias and recognize, no, everyone likes playing the game of Netrunner and like things that are good for standard are often like, like healthy. I, when I say good, I mean like healthy for standard are also healthy for startup because they're healthy for the same fundamental game. Um, mm. And uh, I, I'm, it's been great to see people look at these cards, you know, like some, you know, there's people that are like, a little bit salty that like we could have backroom machinations instead of um uh instead of exchange of information but the startup players get to look at this card and go oh this is super exciting it does something different for us um and uh i don't know it's i i like i'm gateway was a weird spoiler season for me to watch and this has been a a, a fantastic culmination of a set that I was like really excited to see get in people's hands, uh, and this, I, I've been really happy with how spoiler season's been been going. So awesome! I'm glad I'm glad people are are receiving it positively as opposed to negatively. <laughs> yeah, and like all the negative criticism, like, yep, I understand where you're coming from, but the 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 bulk being so positive is uh, is, is great to see. However, I see that Sokka is up, so we're gonna set up Let's the raid. raid. Uh, and let's all go enjoy some Jinteki spoilers. Um, and thank you to both of you so much for coming on tonight. So. Yeah, thanks for having us, Jeff. Appreciate you. Thanks, Jeff. It's been a pleasure being here. Yeah. All right. I th think that should...